advantage. Penalty advantage as he peels around. Buster one, still going for the line. He will it start. Bouncing away. La Sica on the hard line. Bounces one, still going. The inside set to Rampage into Brucky in open space. Look at him go. Marcel Brassi puts his head down. Scully's his winner. He won't hit. Right, he goes up though, chases this one now. It's outside the 22. The ball bounces up and Chitty has it. Genius. Thomas says the Terminator is in. Hello and welcome to 10 Minutes with Brent Russell, Springbok legend known as the Pocket Rocket from 2002 to 2006, a good friend of mine as well, and uh, Brent, or Slothy as your nickname is called because you're so elusive, uh, how are you doing down there in Durban during this crazy global pandemic? Yes, good evening, uh, Dylan. Thanks for uh, calling in, darling. And yeah, so we obviously, uh, um, in the middle of the lockdown, we've got about another week to go. We're going on four weeks now. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I've been quite tough, you know, it's uh, not easy for South Africans to stay indoors, especially when it's been beautiful in Durban, you've got the beach right there, you can't swim, um, and so we're just itching to get out, but obviously we're doing it for a good cause, and uh, yeah, we're all good, I mean, the, the family's, um, the family's uh, all connecting, we're actually enjoying the family time, and um, yeah, no, it's, 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 been, it's been a strange time, but a good time. That's definitely one of the positives to come out of that, you know, spending time at home, you know. Now, uh, Brent, let's go back all the way. We met at university, University of Cape Town. We played rugby together for the legendary Ike Tigers. Uh, what memories stand out about playing varsity rugby for you? I don't remember too much on the field uh, um, stories, but I do remember you trying to tackle Nick Millet in the, in the bar. Please tell me how that went, went off. But no, no, listen, I think those were the good old days. I mean... Um, all I was trying to do was actually trying to get a degree and uh, have fun and study and that and ended up uh, in a rugby club that was that uh, had a good few characters and individuals and um, geez, there's only good fo fond memories there. Um, yes, we obviously um, had some serious games of rugby and I suppose the highlights of that was actually beating um, uh, Stellenbosch under 21s and, and, and just the camaraderie that came out of that. But um, yeah, just staying in touch with with, with certain people. I think that's what the, the game of rugby actually brings to to individuals is that um, you, you actually um, meet meet people that you would never normally meet. Um, you're playing a team sport and you build lifelong friendships. And so that has stuck with me and uh, I'm always appreciative of, 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 of the friendships I've made out of rugby. And unfortunately, one of them was actually you that, that I got to meet. But um, yeah, we've... we've um, we, those were good old days. That was when it all started. Um, never, when I was at UCT, the last thing I was actually thinking of was actually a professional rugby career. Most people don't know, but uh, you and I, with a couple of other folks from the UK and some South African folks, were actually at a boarding school, Bishop's Prep School. We spent a year there coaching sport, being housemasters, um, had a great time, you know. We obviously caused a bit of mayhem as well dur during that year. Um, but uh, uh, what moments stand out for you there? You know, obviously coaching the little kids uh, um, outside of the colonies that we got up to. Well, when I joined Bishop's Prep to do a stooging, I actually meant to try and teach kids and actually really try and do a good job. So I didn't try and cause mayhem. I tried to do a good job. And uh, um, unlike a few other individuals and stooges that were running around there, but the point of that was I really... That obviously was just a great opportunity to, 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 to yeah, exactly, go to UCT, have, uh, have the experiences that we did with, the, with, with being at university as well as actually coaching um, young kids. And, I mean, Bishops being one of the, one of the good schools in, in Cape Town, it was really a good opportunity just to have like-minded people. Of just to, It's all about enjoyment. And, uh, um, yeah, those, those days were... For me, I mean, I've always been a, I've never re regarded myself as a teacher or a coach, funny enough, but um, I, I, I do have fond memories of those times of actually giving back. I think I coached the, geez, under, under 12 Cs. Um, I don't know which team you coached, but yeah. Um, I think I was the A side. I think they put the big guns there, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think you got the A side. <laughs> you were taking it more seriously than what I was, and uh, but um, yeah, it was it was it was good days. I mean, sheesh, I, I, those, we're talking we're talking twenty years ago, and um, 
and uh, there's a lot of good good friendships that were made out of that uh, uh, that year. I mean, I suppose you've you've kept in contact with a lot of the the, the yes. overseas crowd. Yeah, well, after we got expelled, uh, yeah. um, it was uh, <laughs> no, it was it was brilliant times. You know, good overseas crew, uh, Grand McAvoy, the Slug, yourself, me. Uh, it was it was brilliant times. Now, one memory though that comes to mind from 20 years ago. You and I were watching the Sevens World Series, uh, you know, on the, the big screen uh, back at the boarding house one weekend. And the next weekend, I was watching that same big screen and you were carving up for the Blitz box. I think it was the Wellington Sevens or somewhere around there. Tell us how you got into that position. Yeah, so I've always, I've, I've always said, I mean, that's part of my saying is like, um, if you're really enjoying what you're doing and, 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 and you really prepare yourself well, um, yes, they'll always, you'll always get one opportunity in life to actually um, go further. And so, I mean, the only way you can go further and, and, and I suppose get that lucky break is to actually be prepared. Um, and so I, I was just having fun and playing rugby and I, was, I, I don't know, I, I, actually, I actually did behave very well, um, unlike all the other stooges there. So um, I, was, I was actually more fit and I was playing under 21s, um, uh, province and we had a good year that year and um, I just got called up into the the under I got called up into the western province beast B team sevens and I think two three days before we had the tournament someone got injured in the A team and they called me up into the A team and I played two games in the A team at the tournament before Chester came up to me and he said Brent listen if you have a good game the next game um, I want to maybe I'm, I'm considering selecting you so I scored four tries that game just to make sure that you yes. had to select me. And, um, and I got selected, and the very next weekend I was playing um, in the SA7s team. Those days, I mean, there's no real way. It's, it's just pure luck, someone identifying you. You're having a good game. You're enjoying what you do. And, um, yes, I always believed that I had the potential to do it, but I was just actually enjoying what I could do. And, and those six months playing um, in the sevens was, was really a proper highlight for me. I was playing with Chester Williams' team, and the whole thing about it was, was just attacking. And we won our first tournament that SA Sevens had ever won in New Zealand, beating New Zealand in the semis and Samoa in the finals, um, playing with the likes of John de Villiers, Fabian Jury's, Dale Whiteman, I call him White Man, and um, Anton Pitto. There was just some proper portrait. There were some proper players in our team. Um, I don't want to forget anyone else there that might be watching. But Yeah, but that's the thing, though. You took the opportunity. You were more elusive than the Loch Ness Monster. And then the next opportunity that came up was an unbelievable one for you, right? Springbok Trials, which we got to watch on the telly as well. Uh, talk us through what was going through your mind. Now, all of a sudden, you were in the 15 aside big stage, this wasn't sevens where you could just round people like park cars anymore, where you did, but you know, were you nervous? Were you anxious? What was going through your mind during those trials? Yeah, listen, I never in my wildest dreams would I ever th uh, have thought up that I'm going to be sitting on the bench to the SA Springback trials. I mean, here I am 21, 22. I haven't played a carry cap game. I haven't played a super rugby game. I've only played six months of sevens. I was, I was lucky if I was 80, 80 kilograms at the time. Um, couldn't speak a word of Afrikaans. And um, yeah, I've got an Afrikaans coach with uh, a whole team full of Afrikaans players. So everything about that whole experience was, it was against all odds in the sense of mm. being selected. And yes, they obviously saw something in, in me that they, really, that they really liked and they selected me. I only got 20 minutes on the game. And um, I'd like to think that, yes, that's, what, that's the opportunities you get in your life to try and make, uh, try and make a mark. And if, you, and if you are really know what you're doing and what you're prepared, and you, and you, and it's, it's out of your hands at the end of the day. And so that's the opportunity that was presented to me, and I managed to grasp it. And <laughs> two weeks later, I'm sitting on the bench against Wales, and I get my first test um, cap. All right, pal. A couple of quick ones now. Toughest South African opponent you've ever... Faced. Normally, it's a big player, but funny enough, never, no one really um, managed to really show me up in a, in a, in, in a sense like mm -hmm. that. So the only guy that really bounced me probably the, the, the hardest was a, it was a small player that was steppy and it was Enrico January. Oh, no he way. He broke through the line and he stepped, stepped, stepped and I was like, I don't know which way he was going and he came straight and I found myself in my arms two meters back. So that was a little bit embarrassing. I do remember waking up on the ground, looking up and having Tano Umanga staring at me. 
And uh, so, so I always think, and I mean, I've got huge respect for a guy like Tano Umanga purely because he's a, a, such a nice guy and was a great player. Uh, special memories. But now, listen, we'll talk about your time in France and all the other good stuff um, when we get you on for a proper chat on a podcast called The Rugby Hive. Yes. So I look forward to getting you there. But uh, Brent, I want to thank you for your time, but and providing some quality moments in the rugby corner, brilliant memories and, uh, and all that. I think you've got most of those memories in my, men, in my mind etched, you know, the way you were um, flying into people and especially the matron. But um, thank you so much for the interview and uh, thinking of me. And uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to add further comment uh, if you ever give me the opportunity. And yeah, good luck with everything that you've got happening on your side. Thank you, pal. That was 10 minutes with Brent Russell. Keep the change. That sleek sensation. Forget love, Chitty.